the calling. So when you're like fresh off the block and you're just like joining the church people right. behind the scenes, there's so much pressure on this calling, the right. word calling. There's books about calling. There's people constantly asking you, so what's your calling? And you're like, right. I don't know. I just know God is, you know, like got my heart on fire right now. The calling it to me is so wide. I think my calling now is to be in a church, but my calling 10 years ago was to be in the salon. My calling five years from now, I don't know. And so I think the calling in general is whatever God is calling you to in that moment. Are you being obedient right now? Sam, thank you so much for taking time to share a conversation. I've so enjoyed getting to know you, you know, as you lead a church in St. Jen, uh, Missouri, just south of St. Louis. Uh, God has just done so much through your ministry and even through your family. I know you and Bruce have been married. You can tell us a little bit about how long you guys have been married. You, yeah. you have four kids. Tell us a little bit more about yourself for those that are joining in today. Okay, so um, yeah, my name's Sam. Um, I think what's interesting with my story, and, and maybe some can relate, I met the Lord as a, as a really young little girl, um, but through the destruction of life and kind of the, the home scene that I had going on, um, I found myself wandering away from the Lord's, what I thought was the Lord's care. Um, got myself into some pretty rough circles, found myself in some deep addictions, um, and always had this this mindset that I knew God was there. I knew he was real, but I just kept finding myself feeling like I had done too much wrong. I had went too far out, you know, um, I had messed up too much and, and really thought that I had lost the Lord's favor and care and, um, met a, met a young man named Bruce and, um, good looking young guy. <laughs> he was, yeah. and, um, still is, but met a guy named Bruce. And I remember I was still deep in my addiction and I thought I was really covering it up. Well, I, you know, there's something about when you're in addiction, you think that you've got it all packed mm -hmm. away and no one knows what's going on behind closed, you know, doors. But, um, I'll never forget a specific night in my life that really changed what I think the trajectory, um, for my calling and, um, I was getting ready. We just left from a date from a restaurant, Bruce and I, and I was getting ready to get out of the car and Bruce kind of leaned over and put his hand on my, on my arm. And he said, listen, I really like dating you. He said, I really, I think you're fun. I think you're, you know, you're beautiful. He said, I see a lot in your, in, in your future. I think there's a lot more to you. He said, but there's some things that you're doing that I just, I just don't agree with. And I just, I want different for my life. And I just want you to know that. And I remember playing it off like, <laughs> What is he talking about? Like, I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to admit right now what I think he's talking about. I knew what he was talking about, but went into the house that night, went in, into my room in the basement. And I just remember sitting on the edge of the bed and having this moment with the Lord that I had not had in a really long time. I hadn't really spoken to the Lord that deep. Um, again, knew the Lord was there, acknowledged he, his authority and his kingship, but really just felt like I was out of touch and he really could care less what I would say to him. And I remember sitting on the edge of that bed that evening, that night, and just saying, um, God, what, what is it? Where, where am I at right now? What am I doing? And in that moment, the Lord began to say, I think you're beautiful. Mm. I still see so much for you. I have so much for you. Um, I think there's more to you than what you see in yourself. And it, all of a sudden, I just remember bawling my eyes out and, and hearing the Lord's voice. And I hadn't heard the Lord speak in a long time. He probably was speaking, but I was packing it down and yeah. so distracted by the world. Um, and in that moment, it was a life-changing moment for me. I decided right then and there I was going to give up everything. And I was going to, um, literally in that second, I walked over, dug my Bible out of wherever it was packed away, and just began to cry and read the Word. and and that was kind of the new journey that I had with the Lord. So you speak of this catalyst moment that happened for you, largely because Bruce just spoke into to that point in time. Talk to us from that point on in your journey. So you've had this moment where it's kind of a, a shift has taken place. What comes next? Because there was a little bit of time, if I remember you saying, between that moment and when you started ministry. So maybe yeah. fill in that gap for us a little bit. Yeah. So there was like a 10 to 15 year gap there. Um, uh, about a year or two later, we had our first child together. Uh, we have four total, but we had our first child as his and ours. And 
I remember that was kind of like the adulthood in my life. Like, okay, <laughs> life is no longer just about me. Yeah, now I have to care. Real. <laughs> yeah, I got to care for this human. Um, and so, of course, it, naturally I started to mature a lot. Always read the word, was always present with God. But I don't know that it was like deep. Like, I don't yeah. think that I was fully committed. It was still like this dating relationship yeah. with the Lord. Loved him, loved who he was, knew that he was king, but I hadn't made him the king of my heart. And I think yeah. there's a difference, right? Like loving the Lord and then making him your king and a prime authority of your life. Right. And in that 10 or 15 year gap, I really hadn't figured that out for myself. Um, we had another child, we moved away and just, I, I constantly seen God's hand on my life, but I didn't know what it meant. I don't know that I had specifically anyone walking that journey with me, like any mentor or any person that was walking that life with me to kind of show those things and reveal those things to me. So it was just kind of walking blindly with the Lord, like, you know, whatever you bring to my life. It wasn't until, um, I opened a salon, I ended up going to beauty school um, never imagined that would have been a thing for me. I was pretty athletic in school. And so I never would have thought I'd be a hairstylist, but ended up going to beauty school, um, fresh out of beauty school, opened a salon okay. and I did the whole business thing. I chased success, 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 um, knew not one person in that town. And here I was out there like, hi, I'm Sam. I want to be your stylist. And you know, you need a haircut. Um, and so anything to get my name out, anything right. to get the public to know who I was, to know who the salon was. And that was kind of a deep, dark road. I mean, I know that's what they teach us, right? Like in, in, in business, you want to, to brand yourself and brand the company. But I had really lost touch with, um, I should have been branding God all alone, all along. And, and when that clicked about three, four years into that business adventure, the Lord was taking me on, total game changer. Mm -hmm. So you built this thing from the ground up, the yeah. salon. Um, talk to us a little bit about, and you kind of elaborated on this just a moment ago, you're kind of chasing all of this and you're, you're spinning on the wheel a little bit. Talk to us about that season of your life a little bit more as it pertains to how it got you to where you are today. Mm, so okay. you're, you're chasing the success by all the world standards of success and what your life and its purpose and, and meaning is to look like. Talk to us about how that might've been a, like a launch pad to where you are. Yeah. Oh, Tori, that was probably some of the most interesting and beautiful parts of my life so far. I mean, obviously I love my husband and I love my children, but there was something really sweet there that nobody could muster up on, on, you know, on their own. I remember struggling in my own life, struggling in my own feelings and my own um, relationship with the Lord. And the Lord began to speak super clear and just say, what if I could use you right where you were? Mm. What if instead of branding the salon and branding yourself, you allowed me to have my way in what you're doing? How much different could your purpose be? Um, how much, you know, joy could, could um, happen in your life and others' lives if you put me first? And so I really didn't, again, young. I, I started Rage it was the name of the salon, and I started that when I was like 23. Oh, wow. So I was still kind of a baby myself. <laughs> Um, but I let, I chewed on that for a little bit. And so little by little, like I remember thinking, okay, I'm cutting someone's hair. Maybe I could just pray for them as I'm cutting their hair. I'm like physically touching this person. Why don't I use this, you know, opportunity yeah. to pray for him? And then as I got a little bit braver, um, I would shampoo women's hair or men's hair in the shampoo bowl. And I was like, you're physically laying hands on them. Pray for them. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So I just, in my own, you know, my own world would begin to pray over them. Um, and then as I got a little more brave and a little more bold, people would share because that's what you do. Like hairstylist, just in case anyone wants to know, you're like a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone bar, spills yeah. the beans Absolutely. when they're in the salon chair. They, they talk about everything. And so I thought, Sam, you have the perfect opportunity. Maybe this is what God is talking about. And so they would begin to share their stories and their problems. And I would say, man, you know... Um, can I pray for you about that? Can, you know, I know that God is, God is good. And I, I know that if we brought this to him, he could probably do way more than what you or I could in this situation. And people were open to it. And so I think that's what kind of gave me the encouragement to keep going. Next thing I know, like the girls that work for me are on board. We're doing Bible studies before and after work. Um, we're praying with people in the parking lot. We're like laying hands on people in the color room in the back. Um, it was just some of the greatest 
evangelizing times of my life. I mean, I felt the confidence in me, like that even as a hairstylist, that you could be witnessing to people yeah. in a hair salon. Yeah. Um, and I think my favorite out of all of that was when the Lord started cultivating that. Next thing I know, like the stylists that work with me, we would like close down the shop and go to other businesses in town. We're like, we want to pray over your business. That's God awesome. can do what he's done in us. He can do it here in this, you know, insurance office. Um, and it was just, it was good. It was really good. So I think you speak to something that's so huge when we think about this living on mission with God. A lot of people might think that ministry is reserved only for those that are in like a church setting as a pastor or, or some sort of pastoral role. But what you've just spoken to is the fact that ministry can happen wherever you are. And a salon turned into some sacred space yeah. as you were, you know, shampooing people's <laughs> hair, cutting their hair, able to pray for them. And I wonder if you could speak to those that would be listening right now that maybe in a career or a position, a life circumstance or situation where they don't necessarily see that as a ministry opportunity. I mean, I wonder if you could speak to those people that are listening right now. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I think, so there's a local um, plaza tire, you know, it's the only plaza tire. It's really one of the few places to get your car worked on. Um, and I think about just even being a customer there. I know the people's name, Corey. He's the guy, he's the manager there. I know Corey. Um, I know some of the guys that are mechanics there. And I think about if I just as a client come in, I know their names, I get to know their story. You have to sit there for at least 45 minutes, depending on what you're getting done. Um, how much time you have to really get to know someone and how much of an opportunity you have to really do real life with people. And I think about each career path really has some form of that. Women that work in a doctor's office, um, you think you're just going in and filling out paperwork or answering phones or checking people in, but really you're having this personal encounter right. with people. And a lot of times, especially in smaller towns, it's the same people over and over. So you really have an opportunity to do, in my opinion, more work than you do sometimes in the, in the church. Sure. Now that I'm a fresh pastor, um, you know, been a pastor for the last three years, I'm like, oh Lord, I think I was doing better when I was out in the marketplace, you know, I think I had more opportunity when I was actually in this place where people in public were yeah. coming in and out. Um, and there's, there's something that's less intimidating about those places. Like there's something about a church that you just feel like you have to be clean and tidy and have it together. But like in your doctor's office, obviously you're going for a service. So you don't, you have your guard down. You know, when people came in to get their hair done, they had their guard down. They were just coming to relax and share stories and, um, even the ones that used to bring their iPads because they were going to read, girl, they didn't know me. You're not reading nothing today. We're going to talk. So you're that person in <laughs> the doctor's person. office. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Are you that way on planes too? You sit down and start talking to the person next to you? I try not to be because I know people really enjoy their quiet time. <laughs> yeah, that's We do me. enjoy our quiet time on your plane. You're like, that's me, Sam. That's me. I'm, I kid. I kid. No, I think that that's great. And it's so important for those that may not be in you know, capital M full-time ministry to understand that there's an opportunity right where God has placed you. And, and your story is just a testament to that, to, to be faithful to the opportunity of here and now. And, and so let's jump. Where are you here and now? Let's talk about that for a little bit from where you were now to where you are. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. So, um, I've always felt like I share this often with people that, the day Jesus rescued me, that night, you know, for instance, that night sitting on the edge of my bed and, and from that moment forth, God has begun to heal me of past wounds, heal me of things that I did to people, heal me of things that have been done to me. Um, he's restored the way I think. He's just had such a beautiful hand in my life that has change. I mean, if I think about if I was to continue on that path where I was 20 years ago, I would not be here. I assure you that, um, if not alive, probably another 150 pounds smaller. Cause I was just so struck, you know, struck by addiction. Um, but I remember that night sitting on my bed thinking, God, you saved me. And every moment since then he has saved me. And I've just kept making this promise to the Lord that Every bit of my life, I would give back to him. Every ugly part of my life, I would share with the world if it brought him glory. If I needed to be quiet about it, fine. I'll share what he needs me to. I'll open up my life as, as an offering to him. Um, and with each season of my life, just continuing in that promise to the Lord, 
I think God is like, well, she means it. She's serious. Like, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And um, now I'm serving as a campus pastor in a church. Would have never imagined that. <laughs> um, would have not deemed myself knowledgeable or, or worthy to lead people, period. You know, sometimes I don't even know if I'm like, Lord, you want me to lead these four children? <laughs> Do you know me? Um but there's been something super humbling about it. And, you know, a lot of times I think people look at pastors like they're the top of the church and they're this and they're that. But I think I found the last three years that there's something super humbling about a pastor. Really, you're the bottom. You're the one. You're the last one. You're the last one there. You're the, you're the one that's constantly trying to encourage people and push them to, to, to know God's voice, to know where God is moving in their life. Um, and so there's there's been something pretty remarkable that God has been teaching me in the last three years. It's just kind of to die to myself, my plans, my it's dreams. So oh, it's hard. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm just here. I mean, now I'm pastoring, but if he calls me to be a custodian <laughs> or he asks me to go be a mechanic, I don't know how to be a mechanic, but I'll do whatever he wants me to do. Well, I think you speak to something that's so important is just leveraging the season that you're in. And, and so many of us find ourselves wishing we were maybe in a different season, maybe doing something different. Yeah. And so I wonder if you could speak to those that are sitting here wrestling with their calling and they're maybe sensing that it's time to change seasons or to be faithful to the season that they're in, whatever it might be. Can you speak a little bit more broadly to the calling and just being faithful to that which God has put right in front of you here and now? Oh, I, I, yeah, the, the calling. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's so interesting because, you know, I didn't grow up in ministry. I may have grew up attending church, but I didn't grow up in ministry. So when you're like fresh off the block and you're just like joining the church people right. behind the scenes, there's so much pressure on this calling, the right. word calling. There's books about calling. There's people calling constantly asking you, so what's your calling? And you're like, I don't know. I just know God is, you know, like got my heart on fire right now. Um, but I would say like, if I could speak to anyone across the board, people that grew up in the church, people that are new to church, people that are fresh in this, um, season of just knowing that God's doing something, I would say that's the calling. Like I couldn't pinpoint what was happening in my heart. I couldn't pinpoint what was going on in my mind, how every moment I woke up, somebody needed to be saved that day. I needed everybody to know about Jesus. I didn't know that was the calling. I just knew it was this passion to for people to know God. And I really felt, I remember in the early on, like going like, this was what Paul was talking about. When he had his conversion, he felt like everybody needed to know Jesus. And um, the world and, and the church, you know, like to, to not put too much struggle on the church, but the church really puts a lot of pressure on that. And I would love to speak in and just say, take a step back. Mm -hmm. And really the calling it to me is so wide. I think my calling now is to be in a church, but my calling 10 years ago was to be in the salon. My calling five years from now, I don't know. <laughs> and so I think the calling in general is whatever God is calling you to in that moment. Yeah. Are you being obedient right now? Are you, were you obedient this morning? Were you obedient at lunch? Were you, I think that is when, when you're being obedient to whatever he's asking of you, then you're walking in your calling For sure. um, because we don't really know the future. Right. And For so, sure. um, I don't know that any of us will ever, maybe, you know, maybe you have a general idea, like I'm really good at doing this yeah. in the church or in the body or for humanity. Yeah. I have these really cool talents and abilities. And then there's these supernatural things that I do that take over and has nothing to do with me. I have these giftings God has given me. I think it's good to kind of own in on those and have mentors or, you know, smarter people than you in your life to help shepherd those things in your life so that you know season to season where you're supposed to be and where you should be obedient. But I really do think it's a moment by moment thing, you know, the calling. Yeah. I think you speak to something that is often missed because we get so consumed by calling, if yeah. you will. And, and the title, the platform. Right, right. Yeah. That sometimes we miss the, the link between identity coming first. And, and one thing I love from just the times that we've shared with you in our chapel this year, you, you've spoken both times a little bit about how identity shapes so much of this. And, and it's so important to understand whose you are and who you are yeah. because that shapes everything else, including the calling. 
I, elaborate on that a little bit more. You you spoke about that a few times, and I think it's just the key to unlocking all, a lot of this. Yeah. So interesting enough, the moment I acknowledged the calling and really shared it with people, like, "Ooh, hold on," when you share it with people, <laughs> because then all the questions come. Then there's all these opinions right. of who you should be and how you should do it. And you know, the the community that I've lived in the last 15 years, um, it's very country and setting, um, very rural, and and I come from a very different. <laughs> Area. I mean, we. I, I come from a very different type of society. Um, I, like I said, I speak in Ebonics a lot of times. I have a lot okay. of slang. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just <laughs> ask because I'm. You know, I, I'm not as well versed. What is Ebonics? I should Ebonics, know this, but okay. I don't know. It's like the slang words. It's like you know, what up, okay. man? Like you learn what up, man? They're like, what is man? It's like what up, man? But you put a little uh, um, Interesting. or that's fire, and you know, it's just it just means it's really good. So I'm speaking Ebonics sometimes, and I don't even know I'm speaking. <laughs> Yes. Okay, that's good to know. I really hope that's a word. Well, if not, we if made it we up. Made it it's going to work. See? Yeah. <laughs> so Ebonics. I think that a lot of times people want you to be what they want you to be. Everyone has an agenda for your life, for you. But if you don't stay tucked under God's wings and really in tune with Him in the Spirit, you can miss the entire path that He's really calling you to anyway. Um, and so I think about the Lord had a calling on my life as a little girl in a church, an old country church full of like 45. And it just so happened that he used my husband, Bruce, to speak it back and remind me about it that evening. And, um, you know, the people that have been in part of my life throughout that those 15 years of a season, those were people that were still pointing out, you know, who I'm supposed to be. But with or without this person or with or without this place, maybe this is where I received my calling. I'm at this church. I'm working under this person with these really wise people. But if I only follow their lead, and promptings, God may have something totally different in a different part of the world, in a different church 15 years from then. And so it's so important to really just stay tucked into under his wings and know who you're supposed to be. And weird enough, in my little country church, like it, it's working. I don't know how it's working. I do know how it's working. It's the Lord. But, you know, I, I'm so, di I listen to rap music, a lot of rap okay. music. Um, okay. I don't listen to country music. I mean, there's a few songs I'm like, oh, I know that one. Um, but I'm very different. And so I wouldn't have placed myself here. I don't think that anyone that knows me would have been like, that's where she's going to, you know, really do some damage in the kingdom. She's going to really, you know, bring glory to God in this place. <laughs> would have not picked this place. But that's the beauty of it. God has a whole plan for you. And most of the time, it doesn't really have anything to do with our talents or our abilities or who we, it is who we are. But I think it's all about the obedience. Oh. Will you yeah. be who you are in a place that makes no sense to you? Will you say yes to that? Okay, Lord, yeah. let's do this. <laughs> and and that's it sounds so simple, but it's so hard. It I is. mean, in, in life and ministry, it's one thing to say walk in obedience. It's another thing totally different to do that. Talk to us a little bit about the fruit that you've seen in your own life. Just as you've pursued the Lord, as you've, you know, you're now in ministry, your family is, you know, established and growing like talk to us about the fruit of that obedience um of just walking with god and doing you know what it is that he has for you yeah so i would say <laughs> i'm quite the pistol like <laughs> I am. I can be stubborn. I'm pretty ornery. Um, it used to be my way or the highway. Um, I wasn't scared of nobody. You know, like if I got beat up, well, must have, I was supposed to get beat up, but I'm still not going to be scared of you. I mean, there's a lot of rottenness in that. I can own it. Um, but God has really begun to like shave off these rough edges in my life. Um, he's showed me grace, like, Sam, do you see how much grace I've given you? Um, you need to, to help people, other people understand how important that was to you and how important it is to them and how important it is to give to others. And so I feel like I'm 85 in human years <laughs> anymore because yeah. especially becoming a pastor, mm -hmm. you know, just learning to die to myself has been a long, gradual thing. It's definitely not something that happened in a few years. I think learning to die to my own desires, what makes me feel good, what makes me feel comfortable, God has really been shaping that. And it's played out in the way I parent yeah. to not want my kids to do what I think is a way. I mean, it, there's, a, there's this beauty in like wanting them to do what I think is healthy and what is right. safe, but not what I think is best for them. And I look at them now like any other human I would in the congregation. God, you have a path for them and a story for right. them. 
what is my part in that? And I probably wouldn't have looked at it like that five years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, in my marriage, you know, again, uh, stubborn. Did I say I was stubborn? <laughs> you know, the Lord. In becoming a pastor, learning to take the lowest road and being the one that just supports people and, and still leads and protects and guides right. as, in the church. However, as a support to my husband and partnershiping in our marriage, you know, supporting him and loving him and being submissive to him in a new way. God has done that. And that has just been, it is just amazing. Like people take the word submissive and they try to make it one thing and make it ugly, but there is so much beauty in me practicing submitting to him. Um, that I've been able to learn how to do that with the Lord better. And in that it's helped me become more obedient to God. Yeah. So well, and you're in such a position to influence others, um, to, to walk in their own journey with the Lord. And so it's cool that he uses facets of your life outside of your profession to, to help shape your profession. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes we miss that, it, it, that God can use other areas of our life to speak into different arenas of our life. Yeah. And, and, and be it disciplines or even in our yes. relationships, yes. Um, it shapes so much of who we are. So Sam, as you look at the church and specifically even your congregation and those that are within your sphere of influence, but you know, you look at the church or maybe even outside of the Good News Community Church context, where do you see the greatest need for the church to be the church, for the people of God to, to serve where it is that God has them? Talk to us a little bit about that. Oh, I love this question. Um... I love this question because I think this is why I love Oakwood so much. I love being here on campus and I love talking with people because I think that the church could really, we could do better and practice teaching the importance of Sunday is great. Sunday is good. Right. This is our training time. This is our prepping time, our tending to time, our healing time. But the moment we walk out those doors, like the real ministry, the real grit is in the marketplace. It's at the doc. It's at those doctor's offices. Yeah. It's when you're going shopping, you know, when you're, um, I mean, I tell the congregation in St. Jen all the time, like we should be so in tune with the Holy Spirit that we should be saying, all right, Holy Spirit, do you want me to go to BP or do you want me to go to Rhodes? And it sounds silly, but that every moment God can use every single second. Maybe you're supposed to bump into someone at BP gas station that day and they just needed a hug or needed to be encouraged. Um, and I think in the workplace, in our universities, in the church, I feel like, in my own opinion, um, it kind of makes me think, we've heard John Maxwell recently speak, and he, he says often, um, I'm a missionary in the business world. And I love that because I think that all of us are missionaries. And for me personally, I feel like we need missionaries in every aspect of the world. Only then in every uh, workplace and every career point, only then will we begin to see the kingdom of God truly expand. Right. And, and, and if, we, if, if we could do better as a church, in my opinion, um, Christian universities, just really singling down who people are as an individual, like who are you, what can God do through you now, and what does he want to do with wherever you land, in the, in the health field, in you know, teaching kids, um, what can God do through you now? That's when we start to see the kingdom yeah. really grow. Well, and I think there's a posture of readiness that comes with that, like to be ready for God to move, to be ready for him just to use you wherever it is. You speak to going to a gas station, like which one should I go to? You don't have to wait till you get to your office or your cubicle to be like, okay, God, I'm here. Use yeah. me. Although that's the right question. I think it's just a constant state of readiness and being willing to respond. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we've talked about here as an institution, you know, as we're training and equipping the next generation to go out and, and literally help change this world, we talk about being ready and, and following the call. And, and with that, um, it's not about us. Yeah. Like that's the crazy thing. So yeah. it's not about us. It's about how God is moving and how God is working and and in being ready. It's almost like setting your sail for when the wind of heaven wants to just catch. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, our sails are up and we're ready to go. And we've seen that even in recent things in, in the church, things like the outpouring at Asbury, like where there was nothing out of the norm, so to speak, by, you know, our eyes and observations, but 
sails were ready. You know, the, the sails had been cast up and ready to go and the wind of heaven just came and caught in a fresh way. Yeah. Speak to a little bit about your observations and your interactions with Asbury. I don't know if you went or were able to attend in Wilmore. Yeah, I didn't. But what I love about that is we often say at Good News Church, you know, we often say God will jump over, the Holy Spirit will jump over hundreds of thousands of people and go to the one that's hungering yeah. after him. Oh, good. And so, so good. It's so interesting to me to think that that little town, you know, there, that that small university there, um, what is it, like 4,500, maybe 7,000 in the yeah. town? I think the population is very under, small. is very yeah. small. And I think it's interesting how a few people were hungering, you know, for God and just needed more. Just, right. it was like that desperate plea to just touch the hem of his garment. They just so needed more in that moment. They knew that there was more in the Lord. And in that, God brought like over 20,000 people to one location. Incredible, yeah. And I think that that's what God's been desiring to do all along. Like he doesn't need us to have everything put together. He doesn't need us to be tidy or be cleaned up. He wants to use us right where we are. Um, but are we hungering for that? That's and I, I just think a lot of times I think about how much more there is to God. And how much more he can do in us and through us and through all of our lives and in our marriages and change trajectory of our generations of family lines, you know, of, of addictions and hardships and struggles and generational curses. Like, don't get me started on that. But I think that God's like, I have so much more for you as an individual if you would just hunger for me. And so how cool would it be if universities like Oklahoma, you know, Oakwood does this so well. You guys are partnering with churches the best that you can with youth pastors and you're pouring into these youth pastors and the, and the lead pastors at these campuses because you know, like how important it is for students to know who they are, whose they are. Um, but even how much potential is really there for them because you know who God is. For sure. For sure. You speak to the hunger and, and just this deep desire. What do you tell someone that might be listening right now? It says, Sam, I want that. Like, I, I deeply desire to, to see that kind of an outpouring or a fresh move of God in my own life. And I would say I'm hungry. I'm just not seeing it. I'm not sensing it right now. What would you say to that person? Ooh, I would say pace the floor till you till the carpet up. Mm, um, that's so good. <laughs> so there is this pastor, John Bevere. I heard him. Maybe it was a book that I read. Uh, it was about being in the wilderness. And I'll never forget. He said that he had just felt like he was in a dry season. He yeah. did want God. His heart was hungering for the Lord, but it just still felt like the more he prayed, there was still nothing. There was no teardrop that would come down. There was no like, oh yeah, I'm feeling it. No arm hairs raising. There was just nothing. It felt dry. And he said that he told his wife one weekend, he's like, I'm going to go out in the woods. I'm going to go camping. I'm just going to go spend time with the Lord and just, I need quietness. I just need some, you know, solitude with the Lord. So he put up his tent and he's out in the woods and he just begins to sing hymns and he's reading his Bible and, you know, saying scripture out loud and petitioning for the Lord, for the Holy Spirit to move in his heart. Nothing. He goes to bed, gets up the next morning, decides to go for a walk. And as he's walking, he begins to just pray and pray. And he's like, nothing. And all of a sudden, he's like, forget it. I'm going home. That's it. I'm done. And so he started to go home. And all of a sudden, he heard this small little whisper say, fight. And so John says that he begins to just say, fight, okay. And so he just, he begins to think about the wells of Isaac and Abraham and how they had to redig the wells and how, how much work that would have been. But they kept digging and sure enough, the well sprung up, you know. And so he said, I just started, you know, speaking over my heart, over my life, over my emotions right then. Spring up, spring up well, spring up well of life. And there's been seasons in my life where it didn't feel like God was there. It didn't feel like, you know, great things are happening and. <laughs> And, you know, yeah. there was just these, all these wonderful things that you're like, that's God. It felt quiet. It yeah. felt dry. It felt sometimes even mundane and, and, and you know, um, what's the word? Like just typical, you know. But in those moments, God didn't move. God right. didn't leave. Right. He's, he's, he's not left right. the building. And so I think about that, what John says, and there's times where I have to fight it out. And so there's seasons where I'm pacing across my kitchen floor. And I pray that when we, if we live in that house forever, if we move in 10 years from now, you'll see a track across this place that I just, I am just walking and pacing, petitioning for the spring to rise up in me, regardless of how I feel, regardless of whether I want to regardless of how big and long my agenda is for the day, I think there's something to be said for Christians to move past what we feel like doing, right. to move past what feels good or how much time we have on the day to get there. Sometimes you just got to 
dig because the well is there. Yeah, and it's so much deeper than feeling. Like yes. sometimes you actually have to draw on past experiences of where you've seen God show yes. up in a season where you're like, Lord, where are yeah. you? And then there's seasons where it's obvious, where you can see God moving and, and it it is Again, the word that comes to my mind is just obvious. Talk to us about a season of your life maybe where you've seen God moving and just obvious. I right my, now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love, that. I love um, that. Right now, I would say I think this. it's weird to, to, to be in a setting right now um, where people are asking me questions, <laughs> you know, like, oh man, I always tell people like, if I'm the smartest one in the room, we're in trouble. And on Sunday mornings, like the tech people are asking me questions. I'm like, oh Lord, help us. If only they gave you like a pastor's manual. Right. right? To, like, yes. Can you work on that yeah. for us? Uh, maybe. We'll pray about it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's been seasons where I've seen fruit. Um, I see my family where we are now. And so one of the, to me, it's super personal, but my mom didn't go to church with me as a child. You know, she, my grandma took me. Um, and then when we moved, I walked to a church by myself, okay. like the closest little, it was in, a, it was a Pentecostal church. And so that's where I walked to because it was the closest in vicinity. And, um, but my mom would attend here or there, but my mom in the last few years of my life, I mean, this is like a 20 something year prayer. My mom's going to church. She's leading people. Oh, God. She's going to Bible study. Yeah. She's got this single woman's like, oh, the single ladies. <laughs> oh, she's got this group of women. They go out to breakfast on Friday. I and I, just to see her and see the Lord moving in her, like to me, that is just, it's one of the greatest joys of my life. Yeah. Um, and to see my kids doing things, my daughter sings and my son helps with slides, even when he doesn't want to. Um, <laughs> He's a PK. Yeah, you know, that's yes, like part of the, yes. Part of the gig. <laughs> and so it's, it's just interesting to see yeah. God doing stuff like this when I come from a place, a town, an environment that there was a lot of oppression a lot of hardship, a lot of drug addictions, a lot of poverty. And this was never in the cards. Would have never imagined it. So just my life period is the fruit of God's faithfulness. Mm. Oh my goodness. Thank you for sharing your story. I mean, every time that we as an institution, as Oakwoo, we get to you know, engage with you, you make us better. You're one of those people that when you speak in chapel, I, I notice our students leaning in and I would encourage those that are listening now to even go back and find your messages um, to, to hear the word that God has given to you to speak through you. Like one of the things that you've said most recently in, in a chapel is in talking about this idea of surrender and yielding and, and giving full control to Jesus. I, I just want to share, like, a couple students have even come up and said, hey, I, I realize that that's where I'm at. Like, I want to make that decision and are talking things even like next steps like baptism. And so I just want to tell you, the fruit of your life, the fruit of your ministry is changing lives. It's changing uh, even our campus. And so I just want to say thank you for being faithful to the call, to to being faithful to the one that's called you more, more importantly. So yeah. we've got a couple rapid fire, you know, questions here, just oh a little boy. bit more lighthearted for you. Okay. You know, we, we've dove straight into the deep end here on some of the heavy questions. So we're going to, you know, just keep it light here for okay. a moment. Who's your favorite sports team? This can be professional or college. You you pick. Chiefs all the way. You're a Chiefs. Okay, so are you a Mahomie? I am, but I will tell you, when I met Bruce, he was a Chiefs fan then, and they really stunk. I mean, okay. like we've, he, my you husband is, true. yeah, he okay. has been a Chief. he's not a, what do they call it, bandwagon guy. He's okay. not a, he's Ooh. been a Chiefs fan through and through, and so we'll because that. my boys love it, I, I've learned <laughs> football now because of them, so. Okay, so if you could pick any, like, career beyond what you're doing right now, what would you What would you be doing? Funny. Can I tell you two? Yeah, because oh, they're two totally different things. Okay, I'm kind of a foodie. If you okay. can't tell, I love me some food. I love the culture of food. I love all the yeah. different. So, in a perfect world, I would be a food taster. Like, is Ooh. that a thing? Like, what are the food critics? If it's food not, critic. it needs to be. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. for a living, for a life, just travel around, <laughs> eat people's food. You What's know? your favorite food genre? Oh, I don't, I mean, my family would say Mexican food oh, because I could eat it. it every day, but anything rice and beans, Dave Ramsey would love me, uh, <laughs> you know, but I love all food. I love a good steak. Okay. Um, see, I could talk for hours. So a food critic. <laughs> yeah, I, I can get food behind critic. that. I, I honestly wanted to be an athletic 
um, therapist. Like I wanted to travel okay. with the team, a sports team. I wanted to ride the bus with them. I wanted to, you know, work with them and stay yeah. in shape. And I'd be on the court with them, on the sidelines with them, doing <laughs> life. Like it would have been cool, cool to do that. So Physical maybe therapy. if someone from the Chiefs are listening right now oh. and God opens the door for yeah. a, or a chaplain. Season, Oh, yeah. Can, can I yeah. be their chaplain? Maybe. Just maybe the door would open. <laughs> Although I, I think God has you right where he wants you right now. Thanks. Yeah. So. Sam, thank you. Thank you again for just being an open book, sharing your story, and, and making us better. So we appreciate you, friend. Thank you. Thank you.